earlier I'd been telling you all that we were planning on doing a trip up to New England to do some whale watching this fall. And unfortunately, nature had a different idea for us. Um, we had some pretty strong winds here. Our roof is ruined. Tree fell down, ruined a, ruined a fence. So we got to take care of that. Our budget shrank a little bit. And we began asking our friends for some advice on other things that we could do. Places we could go. And they started sending us some national park links and state park links that we uh, decided to go ahead and check out. We went to Mammoth Cave National Park up in Kentucky, which was only about an hour and a half drive from Nashville. Hey folks, welcome to the Down the Road Travel Channel. My name is Will Van Winkle. Today we're talking about Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. Drawing an estimated 640,000 visitors per year with just under three quarters of those electing to take part in tours of selected sections of the over 400 miles of known caves. Mammoth Cave is the longest known cave in the world. Geologists speculate there are hundreds of miles more yet to be discovered. The park is located about an hour and a half north of Nashville two hours, give or take, south of Louisville, Kentucky. During COVID, tours were on a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, so it was recommended that you arrive early to get those tickets. Uh, but now reservations can be made once again by going online at www.nps.gov slash maca slash index.htm. I have put that on your screen because that is a lot of letters to remember. Um, this was recommended to us several times. We decided to go ahead and make a day trip out of it because it was so close. Uh, set, I had my GPS set to avoid freeways and I didn't realize that. So it took us about two hours to get there on back roads from the Nashville area. Still not that bad. Um, and when I looked at the website before we left, tickets were sold out and seemed to be sold out a few weeks in advance. So if you're gonna make those reservations for the cave tours, make sure you do so well in advance. Because of this, we knew we wouldn't be making the journey underground, so we made plans for after our little day trip. Uh, however, when we arrived, we went straight into the visitor center and saw that there were still several tours available. So I'm not sure if they had cancellations or if they reserved some space for walk-up guests. Unfortunately, because we had already made evening plans, uh, we didn't have time to take the tour. So we just kind of explored the park and checked things out. While at the visitor center, uh, we were surprised by the fact that there is no day use fee. For most national parks, just to go in, you have to pay something. Uh, but I think they get enough money off the cave tours that they don't need to do that. We discovered there are three souvenir shops, and each one has slightly different offerings. Dana had already purchased some things at, at the first one that we went to, and then we found the second one. And then when we were at the second one, we heard about the third one. The third one is in a temporary shack outside the building, and they offer some discount items as well. So, you know, if you're one of those that has to get a souvenir wherever you go, make sure you check out all three because you may end up with some buyer's remorse if you don't. The park itself boasts plenty of activities other than just cave tours. Visitors can go canoeing, kayaking, through uh, about 31 miles of streams. There's plenty of hiking with over 85 miles of trails to explore. There are cottage rentals and camping as well. Once we left the visitor center, we went off to look for the ferry. Uh, water levels in Kentucky right now are extremely low. So we're not sure if the ferry wasn't running because of the low water levels. We're not sure if we just didn't find it because signage in the park does leave something to be desired. We noticed whenever we approached an intersection, um, the signs that we were following seemed to disappear. Usually we went straight and we found what we were looking for. There were a couple times where we went straight and we have no idea if we were on the right path or not. We just got to a point where we would turn around. So keep that in mind when you're driving through the park. We did find several old cemeteries and we even stopped to look through the Adwell Cemetery, which was on the way to Denison Ferry Day Use area. Uh, we found headstones dating back to the 1800s 
alongside some that were so old and weather that you couldn't tell what was written on them anymore. Once we were done at the Adwell Cemetery, uh, we went off to the Denison Ferry Day Use Area, looked at it. As I said, the water levels are extremely low. There was one little pool of very, very blue water. And then off to the side, you saw like the muddy water. So we're not sure if the water is usually that blue or that brown. Uh, it'd be nice to know. So whenever, if you go there while the water levels are normal, send us some pictures. When we finished up at Denison Ferry, we made our way over to one of the camping loops. We saw only two RV sites with electric. Most of the sites were very small. You might be able to squeeze a 16 foot RV in there, maybe a class B, but you wouldn't have power. Um, they do want generators stopped at a certain time because this is a certified dark sky park. That means you have a great view of the stars at night if it's a clear night. Um, the camp store right by the camp loop had showers. There are bathhouses located in the camping loops with showers as well. There's a small restaurant in the park, but it is in a temporary shack at the moment while the main location undergoes some remodeling. If you need electric and water hookups, fear not. There are plenty of campgrounds nearby. Uh, we're not sure if all the loops were the same way or if it was just the one that we went through. I do believe that this is set up more for tents and maybe teardrops than it is for big RVs, kind of like the one I'm sitting in right now. After touring the campground, we decided it was time to take in one of the shorter trails and we headed back towards cave, the Cave City side of the park to the Sand Cave Trail. In 1925, a renowned cave explorer by the name of Floyd Collins was trapped in the cave when the entrance collapsed. They organized search parties, they brought out food, picnics. The sign will tell you it was like a carnival-like atmosphere. Not sure if they were happy that Floyd got trapped in there, if they just made the best out of a bad situation. They brought food in. You'll see um, old mason jars were found in the area uh, because they were bringing food to bring to, to Floyd. Eventually, there was another collapse. A lateral tunnel opened, and they found Floyd's body. Um, it's unclear because they don't say what happened to him, if the body was uh, recovered or not. Uh, we heard several people saying that the body was still there. Now, they put up some developed paths just because this, this cave in particular, I think there's still some rock slides and maybe some mud slides. And of course, we saw a family down by the mouth of the very cave that had collapsed almost a century earlier. I don't know if that's brave or stupid. I wouldn't do it myself. Yes, it's been a century since a major collapse, but there are still rock slides, so I wouldn't venture off the path if I were them, especially if there are warnings not to do so, because, you know, if the rangers come out, I don't know if there's a fine, I don't know if it's just a ticket, I don't know if they just tell you to get back on the path or tell you to get out of the park. So do with that what you will. Use it at your own risk. Walking through the park, we did notice a, an abundance of daffodils. Uh, this typically will mark where old homesteads once stood. We even saw part of one of those near the Sand Cave Trail. Um, now, by now, some of you are thinking my kid would hate this. Oh, look, another tree, another rock. Have no fear. About 15 minutes away is Cave City. At Cave City, there are several casual dining and fast food options, including the all-but-extinct Long John Silvers and A&W combo. Between the park and Cave City, you'll find river outfitters for canoe and kayak rentals, artisan shops, uh, Jesse James Mini Golf, staying true to the memory of the outlaw, as he was famous for miniature golf, uh, Jellystone RV Resort, Diamond Caverns is nearby, Lost River Cave is just down the road from that. Heading back towards Cave City, you'll run into Dinosaur World, which is part of a three-park chain uh, Guntown Mountain, which is basically an Old West setting, uh, complete with gunfights every 15 minutes. The park, however, has changed hands quite often, and it seems to close every time it does so. Uh, so we have no idea if it'll be open when you go there. We're not even sure if it was open when we went there. We did see cars going up there, but there's no way of knowing. Uh, I saw something when I looked it up that it had just changed hands back in July of 2022. So, no idea if it's open. These both seem to appeal more towards younger visitors than they do to teens. Overall, we found this not to be much in the lines of a honeymoon destination, which is what we were looking for. 
Um, unless, of course, you and your spouse are super outdoorsy. It does seem like a great place for a weekend or week getaway vacation. Or if you're just looking for an inexpensive place to stay in between Louisville and Nashville, to sample all the offerings that are in both of those cities. I hope you enjoyed this video. We have plenty of trips planned, and obviously we take spur-of-the-moment trips quite often. So be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you down the road. I won't be coming home. Let's hit the road.